table or a uh, place to write. There are two seats over here on this end, two seats over here, and these unfortunate two seats in front of me. <laughs> but if you want a place to write and you don't want to just sit in a chair, you're more than welcome to come up here and uh, grab one of these uh, prime locations, okay? So we are in Daniel chapter 2 tonight. And we'll be getting going here. Uh, session two, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great image. And tonight we'll be digging through this passage here in chapter two. And before we get into it here tonight, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you've blessed us uh, in so many ways. We thank you, Father, for the great book of Daniel. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bless uh, our time together tonight as we study chapter 2. Help it, Father, to um, make sense to us. Help us, Father, to understand what you're trying to say. Help us, Lord, then to apply it in daily living, Lord, for we know that knowledge in itself is just knowledge. But, Father, we pray that we would derive wisdom from your word here tonight. So bless each one who's here tonight, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Daniel is uh, going to become uh, somewhat prophetic for us here tonight as we get into chapter 2, and we look at some of the historical components that are part of this vision that the king has, and it's kind of an exciting um, opportunity to look at these kingdoms and then see what God is doing in the future. Uh, there's so much to say, there, there really is, and uh, as we get into this tonight, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, plenty of time. Looking here at verse 1, Daniel chapter 2, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Babylon was the nation that overran Assyria in 612 B.C. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. They fell to the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar at the time was a general who was very prolific in his military ways. And so there's really no surprise that he climbs the ladder, so to speak. He's now in charge. And he is a very powerful king. However, the interesting thing at this point in time is that with regard to the Babylonian kingdom itself, the Babylonian kingdom at this point is starting to actually wane, um, even though Nebuchadnezzar is there. One of the things that we're going to talk about tonight when we talk about these various kingdoms is the fact that these kingdoms uh, vary in size. Uh, Babylon, when you look at it, isn't going to be necessarily the biggest one, but it's, very, it's been very well organized and it's lasted a very long time. So here is Nebuchadnezzar, this incredibly powerful man. We pick this up in verse 1. What do we find out? We find that Daniel and his three friends, they stand out among these young men who have been exiled off from Israel all the way to this foreign land, and they're now in Babylon. The Bible tells us there, if we back up into chapter 1, and it kind of sets this up for us, in fact, um, when it talks about Daniel and his three friends, they entered the king's personal service in verse 19. And as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. Cyrus the king will be that king who comes later and is involved in this conquest uh, down the road here, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, as, as time goes on. Notice here in verse 2, the king gave orders after he has this dream. Now, this is a very special dream. It's not just like the dreams you and I have. Uh, we tend to have dreams. Our dreams vary uh, because our dreams can be precipitated upon events during the day. We, we know that that's the case. A lot of times we'll have a, a, a dream that may have something to do with what we ate before we went to bed. Um, it may have something to do with some of the events that we saw in the news. I mean, it, it can be that type of working in our subconscious. This is a dream that is a divine dream. It has been given to the king. And the king, at this point, is going to seek 
to have it interpreted. And so he is going to go out of his way to find out if this troublesome dream can be interpreted. And the Bible says that he calls for uh, the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, and anybody else who might be able to help him. <clears throat> he is looking for some type of an answer. Now, these people are, are fascinating people. If you uh, look at the people that are designated here in this passage, the first one he talks about is the magicians. He talks about these magicians. Um, this is actually a group that really doesn't have anything to do with the Magi, if you looked at the original Hebrew. Um, these were actually the chief teaching priests there in Babylon. The enchanters, uh, or the conjurers, as it is in the New American Standard, uh, those of you who have New King James, what's the words that they have in there for those? Astrologers for conjurers? Sorcerers, okay. The, the second one, the conjurers or the enchanters, are actually chorus boys that used to chant. And they would go through and they, they would be chanting. The sorcerers were men who used herbs uh, to cast spells on people. Uh, it's almost like witchcraft. Sometimes they would cast a good spell on a person. Sometimes they would cast an evil spell on someone. Key thing to remember is the fact that you are dealing with a pagan nation here, and it is reflected with these people. The Chaldeans, um, much of the times uh, this reference priests of the group of the Babylonians. The soothsayers are the last one, or however it is uh, interpreted in your Bible. Uh, here it's going to talk about these sorcerers or the soothsayers, however it's termed there. That last term uh, that's used, you'll find here is a reference there to these stargazers. And they might translate that astrologers. These were people who actually predicted the future based on the stars. The interesting thing is at this point in time, there is tremendous scientific uh, knowledge in early Babylon, especially with this area of astronomy. Um, about 500 BC, uh, the interesting thing, I'll just give you a little tidbit here. About 500 BC, they calculated the year to be 365 days, 15 minutes, and 41 seconds long. That's pretty good. The actual is 365 days, 26 minutes, and 55 seconds. So they're off about 10 minutes. So shoot them, right? <laughs> okay. So no, I shouldn't say that because Nebuchadnezzar probably would if, if he had a gun. Um, he wasn't the most... Um, uh, stable individual, perhaps, at this point. Well, it's interesting, too, to stop and think, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, more when we get to Daniel and the prophecy of the 69 and 70 weeks. But I want you to think about this with me a little bit, because back in the time of the Bethlehem star, think back to the birth of Christ. You have the wise men who travel from the east. They see the star rise from the east. And it's interesting, if you go back and you look in the annals of history, there's not a lot of history that's actually uh, still available for us from the first century because most of it was destroyed during wars and other conflicts. You can come across, however, a man by the name of Philo who wrote extensively on the world history at the time. And Philo, being this first century historian, writes about some of these schools that were there and they were to educate people with regard to the study of the stars or astronomy. And it's pretty fascinating because there were different groups that were, were actually broken up. And there was one group that was known as the Eastern School uh, of these students. And the Eastern School, they were actually proto-scientists. Uh, they were uh, people who were um, very learned. And they had some, some real natural uh, inclinations towards understanding even the, the, the world view. And they had um, a natural order that they understood very, very well. And even when you look at uh, Matthew and his writings, he talks about these wise men from the East. Some people believe that actually... He's not talking about just from east as in the compass east, but from the eastern school, which was this very highly trained group that has ties back to Daniel. 
So wouldn't it be fascinating if we would stop and think about Daniel and his influence continuing all the way on towards the birth of Christ? Now, what really kind of blows my mind is what we're going to talk about when we get to Daniel's 70th week, and we're talking about the 69th week and some of the time factors that would put them on notice. So we'll get there, okay? I promise. It's really, it's really pretty neat stuff. But I want you to see how God is just working all of these things out. And he is, he is drawing from this. He's putting this person into a position of authority. Uh, these are people that had opportunities to have books. You know, Daniel had an opportunity to write. He's having these visions later on here in the book of Daniel, and he's writing them down. And he pens them, and it's this, uh, this certain select group of individuals, especially these from this, this Eastern school, who have the opportunity to access these books. The average person in Babylon did not have access to written material. And so God knew that. And God places Daniel in that high position of authority there, and it trickles down. And there's no doubt that there's an influence there uh, that has been left from the time of Daniel, who never leaves Babylon. Remember that. He gets old and he dies there. He never goes back to Jerusalem. He never heads on back through, even though uh, they were starting to return. <clears throat> so Daniel has this tremendous influence. So you have all these people. They're trying to figure this out. These are people that have not been influenced by Daniel, however, yet. And so the king says to these individuals, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. The Chaldean spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants and we'll declare the interpretation. And the king replied to the Chaldeans, the command from me is firm. If you don't make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you'll be torn, got to get this, you'll be torn limb from limb. Your houses will be made into rubbish heaps. Not, no pressure. <laughs> Aren't you lucky you got this job, right? I mean, it's like, oh, boy, I'm this great Chaldean. Yahoo. And uh, now what? So the king, it comes to them and says, listen, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. And, and this is the, the difficulty. He's, um, he's going to use this Aramaic uh, language, and, and he's speaking to them in their tongue. And uh, the test is, the decree is, is gone for me. I've given you... Uh, the reason, you've got to come up with this dream and then give me the interpretation. By the time you come to verse 7, they answered a second time and said, uh, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we'll declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time. My mother used to say, you're stalling, Kevin. <laughs> Did you ever get that? Time for bed. Well, you know, well I got to do this. And I got to check on this. And you know, you're stalling. You need to get to bed. The idea is they're bargaining for time. Why don't you suppose Nebuchadnezzar doesn't want to tell them what the dream was? Yeah, they make up something, right? They could just make up something. He wants to know that they have some, some actual power, and he wants them to tell them what the dream is. So they come to the king and they say, it's absolutely impossible. It's impossible. We cannot come up with this in any way, shape, or form. And basically, the king goes to his high command, and he tells them um, basically to take these people out and kill them. And by the time you get down to verse 13, they're looking for Daniel and his friends to kill them too, because they're all part and parcel of this big group. So here they are. They're kind of stuck, and it, it's a difficult situation. When Daniel hears about it, though, uh, he goes to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who'd gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he said to him, for what reason is this going on? And Arioch tells him, so Daniel goes in and he requests of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Now, this is a fantastic opportunity. It's Daniel's amazing opportunity. And so Daniel goes into his house. He gets a hold of his three Jewish friends. I love how they use the Jewish names here in verse 17. And they request compassion from the God of head concerning this mystery <clears throat> so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And so here's this prayer request. We're looking for the compassion of God. Uh, Daniel knows that in himself, he can't come up with it any better than the other ones can. No one can. This, if, this is going, if the truth is going to be told, if it's going to be established what this dream really was, it's going to have to be through divine circumstances that it's revealed. 
And so that's exactly what happens. Verse 19, the mystery is revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel goes on with tremendous praise. He says, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. And we're not going to take the time to go down through that and, and try to pull that apart. But I want you to see verse 22 and take note of that. He says here, and it's really kind of a, a key point to everything that we're going to talk about here this evening. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. So in this situation, we have an understanding here of who it is that is in charge of the world that we live in. Uh, is it happenstance that Donald Trump is running against Hillary Clinton? Is that just by accident? You might think, wow, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but actually, it is God who, who places these people into these positions of higher authority. And last time I checked, the President of the United States is a pretty powerful person. Uh, God has a plan in all of these things. And it's, it's pretty amazing. But never forget that fact. Never forget the fact that it is God who is the kingmaker, not men. God is the kingmaker. I'm going to look at some other passages of Scripture here in a little bit just to underscore that for all of us because there's some amazing passages of Scripture that just point that out. And you will walk away from here going, you know what, whatever happens in the United States where I live, because we look at life like this, right? This is the United States, and here I, is where I live, and oh boy. Um, the reality is God is still in control, and he's the one who is the kingmaker. I'm at peace with that. I truly am at peace with that because I know he has a plan, and he works all things together for good. So here's the vision. We're going to come down here to this interpretation. Daniel um, has this revealed to him by God, and he comes before the king. He makes sure that the king understands that this is coming from the mouth of Jehovah, verse 28. However, he says, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. As for your mystery, the verse before, about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, or diviners are able to declare it to the king, but there is a true God in heaven. And the true God in heaven knows all things, and he is able to reveal the truth to these people. And King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to listen to what this dream means. And so he says in verse 31, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue that statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head, the statue, was made of gold, fine gold, actually. Its breast and its arms were made of silver. Its belly and its thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Okay, so we're starting to get this picture. We've got this enormous, enormous statue. And so, you know what it always reminds me when I read that passage? What, what, what do they get when they win something for like TV awards or Oscars or something? You know, every time I see that statue that those people are walking around with, this is the passage I think of. I don't know why. <laughs> I, and I can't, even, I can't even draw it, you know? I mean, it's just not gonna work out, I mean. Now, quit the laughter. I mean, a little encouragement would be good right about now. <laughs> oh, dear. Parker number two. All right. Yeah. Can't draw hands. Pictionary, dead. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to remember, it was a statue. It wasn't a person. See, if it was a portrait, I'd be like into drawing whiskers or something. Okay. All right. So you get the idea. Now it looks like the abominable snowman. <laughs> Oh, 
All right. On his head, his head is what? Gold. Perfect. Yes, fine gold. Fine gold. And his arms and his chest, we got to give him some pectoral muscles. Okay? This is all silver. And his stomach area is what? What else is bronze? Okay, this is his kneecap. It goes down to the other kneecap. The little bony kneecap there. Yeah, there you go. And what's below his knees? Iron. So is it, it's iron, but how far down does the iron go? Okay, so iron. And what about the toes? Iron and clay. All right, so that's his big toe, right? And it's mixed. It's mixed. All right, so this is probably something you never forget. You have a dream about it tonight. You'll wake up in the morning and you'll know what it means. That's the good thing. You don't have to call me on the phone and say, I had a dream. All right? Good. As we look at Nebuchadnezzar and what he has seen, uh, he is explained this to him to the T by Daniel. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed, however, it says, all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain, and it filled the whole earth. So what is happening is we have this enormous stone, as it were, which is going to come, and it's going to crush the feet here of this statue. Now, this was the dream. Now we'll tell you its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Wherever the sons of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, he's given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. Do you notice there as Daniel's describing the king, he is describing the king's greatness. He's describing his breadth of uh, influence. But he is very, very quick to point out that who is the originator of this authority? It is God. It is God. And so he says, you are the head of gold. So it's not so much that Nebuchadnezzar is the head as much as it's Babylon that he sits over. He says here in verse 39 that there's another kingdom. So when you look at your notes there, you'll see there's a summary of this interpretation. The image that he's talking about here is actually a reference to the satanic-dominated world kingdoms of the past coming through to the end times. Number two, this golden empire, which is Babylon. You might want to just draw a line there. The golden empire, it culminates in ten contemporary kings. That's going to be the ten toes. And we'll get to that further in Daniel chapter 7. But we're going to talk about that tonight as well. These toes are destroyed by Christ at the second coming. Daniel chapter 2. And we'll get to verses 44 and 45. Christ then establishes his kingdom. This is that stone which once it does smash, it becomes a tremendous mountain. And it's speaking there of what? Millennial kingdom. How wonderful that uh, will be. The kingdom progresses in deterioration with the lower valued metals reflecting a poorer quality of the empires. So the metals are less val of less value, but they're higher in strength. 
And that's an interesting observation. Gold is relatively what? Soft, exactly. But what would you rather have, gold or silver? Depends what you're doing, right? It depends what you're doing. I mean, you might want to have silver if it's a little stronger, but value-wise, the gold is more valuable. When you get down to bronze, what would you rather have, silver or bronze? Normally, we'd say silver. It's of greater value. By the time you get down there to iron, no one ever confuses the value of iron with gold, right? Iron, it's all over the place. It's easy to get. And when you finally get down to the very bottom to the toes, you find the 10 toes are actually clay and iron that is mixed, and it's even less valuable. Notice uh, there in your notes, the higher in strength is denoting here a stronger military and a dependency on strength. The nations are also able to mix better with each other as the kingdoms go on losing their nationalistic qualities. By the time you get down to the toes, we'll, and again, we'll talk about that more in a few minutes here, um, but there's a mixing that takes place between that iron and the clay. Notice with me here in, in verse uh, 36, uh, you have the explaining of the times of the Gentiles. This was the dream. I'm going to give you the interpretation and Daniel begins to go on down through. He explains to him again that this first kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, the gold head speaks of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's why the reason for that is Nebuchadnezzar had absolute control over the kingdom. It was very united. It was very powerful. And it's known as the golden city. You'll notice um, over in Isaiah that there is a destruction that is going to, to take place uh, this wonderful city is actually prophesied about. Um, let me just pick this up here in Isaiah uh, 14 and verse 3. It will be in that day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, that you'll take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressor has ceased. This is a phenomenal passage because it notices uh, the pride and the arrogance on the part of Babylon. In fact, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 14, this is actually a passage that reflects Satan's fall. Uh, when Satan is there in heaven, um, the reference there in verse 13, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Those are the five I wills. Uh, maybe you've heard of the five I wills. That is Satan saying, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And God says, you won't. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to not go any further. Um, but Babylon is a very proud nation, and it wants to um, assume some of that, that hierarchy aspect. And so it's important to note where Nebuchadnezzar is standing. Notice verse 39. You come to verse 39. We read, after you there will arise another kingdom. It's inferior to you, the Bible says, than another third kingdom of bronze which will rule over all the earth. So the second kingdom is actually the Medo-Persian kingdom. It's inferior, I believe, because it had a dual aspect, the Medes and the Persians. Uh, what didn't have the, the unity. And the kingdom that is designated by silver um, is going to come along and it's going to crush, and that's going to be Cyrus the Great who crushes Babylon. And that's going to happen in the course of history uh, over time here. So you have Nebuchadnezzar, um, he's running around about 562 BC. Uh, after him is Evil Merodach, who released Jehoiachin after 37 years of captivity. Nabonidus is actually the last king of Babylon. He's the last king. Uh, most of the time, Nabonidus used to let his son, Belshazzar, who we'll find later on in the book of Daniel, he let him do the ruling, uh, and he would step back. Um, and there's some reasons for that. Um, one, he's not a Chaldean and so forth. But Babylon is, in 539 B.C., if you want to make a note, it's captured by Cyrus the Great. Later on, you'll read uh, about some of the, the laws of the Medes of the Persians. You have Darius, uh, for instance, 
also um, following Cyrus um, with that. The third kingdom is the Greek kingdom. So the Greeks are going to follow the Medo-Persian kingdom. And at this point in time, all we're reading about right here is the fact that there's another third kingdom. We don't get a lot of information. But if you look at the course of history, the Greek kingdom follows after the Persian kings. And it's at this point that you see the belly and the thigh is made up of bronze. Bronze is a symbol that actually suggests a strong, spectacular army, but a weakness in its centralized government. Who was the great Greek conqueror? Alexander the Great. And he conquers the entire known world all the way out to India. And he's pictured later in Daniel as the rough he-goat who destroys a ram with two horns. We'll, we'll, we get to Daniel chapter 8, we'll get into some of that symbolism. Then he says here, there's a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. Remember, when we get to these metals and they're stronger metals, they are suggesting what? The stronger metal is suggesting more military. more military might, more military power. Roman Empire comes along and destroys the Greek Empire, and it's noted for its military strength. The Roman army is amazing at that point in time. I mean, it really is a, an amazing machine. And we identify the fourth kingdom as Rome. Uh, for a number of reasons. It follows Greece. Only Rome really crushed and dominated. And it's interesting here, but the ten toes fit nothing in the Greek Empire. In verse 44, as we go down through, these are mentioned as these ten king or ten toes are called kings. And the ten toes run parallel to the ten horns that we'll get to in Daniel chapter 7. And they're also parallel to the ten horns in Revelation 13 and 17. In Revelation, they're called kings. So here they are, and it says, It will crush and break all these in pieces, verse 41, in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom but it will have in it the toughness of iron as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. The word brittle there literally means uh, fragile, uh, has to do with being broken. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay and they'll combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine or adhere with pottery. So we look at this Roman Empire, which is the fourth empire, and we understand uh, that this Roman Empire that he's talking about, as he's looking back and he sees these four amazing, these four amazing kingdoms, Notice there in your notes there, the feet and the toes. They're made of clay. And you see these things, and you're sitting there going, what in the world, you know, I, I don't understand how it, it all uh, works together. But one of the things that we realize uh, as we look at this, there's reasons for us looking at it and saying, this is a kingdom that will continue on. Notice with me here, and you might want to take a, a couple notes there. You could kind of go down below maybe the present day Roman civilization period um, and looking at that. But I believe here as we look at this, we understand these four kingdoms. There's, there's not a lot of question in our mind. We understand what they are. Uh, these kingdoms, by the way, are being prophesied of. At the point when Daniel is writing... Daniel's writing about a kingdom. Which kingdom is he writing about? The first one. The second one is silver. That's a reference to Medo-Persia. They hadn't come along and conquered yet, had they? They were yet future. Did Daniel know anything about Alexander the Great? 
Did he know anything about the Roman Empire? You see how amazing this prophecy is? I mean, this is really like rock your socks type of prophecy. And, and then you come to Zechariah. And how many have studied Zechariah? That's, a, that's an interesting book. I, I said studied it, not read it. <laughs> oh, man, Zechariah. Zechariah is deep. I mean, that is, that is one deep section of the pool. Um, and we're going to go over there for just a little bit here tonight because I want to show you some, some cool stuff. But Zechariah is writing, and Zechariah is actually writing in the time of the, the Medes and the Persians. And uh, so he's looking kind of back 16 years towards uh, the Babylonian Empire, but he's in the Persian, but he's not seen anything about the Greeks or anything about the Romans. And yet this is exactly what we're looking back on now. And we're saying, whoa, this prophecy here is really worth studying because look at how much has actually transpired. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's really cool. Why don't you see something else that's really cool? Now look at this and understand that when he's talking here about these feet and he gets down there to the toes, that the toes of the feet, they're partly iron, partly baked clay. When you come to verse 41, and he's talking about that. That the emphasis here is that there is a long gap of time. And I believe that between 41 and 42, uh, there is a gap of time. The gap falls between, historically speaking, it falls between the fall of Rome and the restoration of it at a still future time. So we would hear about the revived Roman Empire. If you, if you study prophecy, you understand that you'll hear about the revived Roman Empire. How many have heard of the revived Roman Empire? Okay, a bunch of you have. Basically, what is being spoken here is that this Roman Empire that was um, established back there in the time of the Apostle Paul, <clears throat> there, were character, there are characterizations of that that continue today. So as you look back to world powers, you're looking back to Babylon. It owns it all, basically. Uh, then there's the Assyrians. They go up. They pound on the Assyrians. Medo-Persians come and take them, and they own it all. And then later on, you see, you've got powerful kingdoms. You've got things like Egypt that's going on, but they weren't world domination type of kingdoms. You come down the road, and you look, and you see Greece with Alexander the Great, and then you see the Roman Empire. Are you, are you with me? So you have these major, major empires. And you have Britain, but it's not the same. It's not the same. It's, it's spread out. And yeah, they've got ports and different things in different places. But it's not the world domination. And key point, they didn't have, these nations didn't have the significant role with the people of Israel. Okay? These nations that we're talking about, these four great powers, had a great influence on the people of Israel. And they were enemies of Israel. Would you say the Roman Empire was an enemy of Israel? Who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD? The Romans. Right. You can go on all the way back through. Who was it that took Daniel and carted off these fine young men from Jerusalem and took them all the way to Babylon? Babylonians, right? Yeah. And you can look down through and you, and you can see the, the influences. Even after uh, the King Nabonidus dies there, you have Cyrus the Great, and he's an influence as well. So these nations that God rose up, he rose, yeah, he raised them up in order that they might judge the people of Israel, his chosen people, and allow them for other nations then to come and judge them. And that's what we're talking about. So when you look at this, there is a continuation, and I have listed there um, similarities in religion, Roman Catholicism, for instance, language, Latin base, arts, the law, everything but England, um, the economy. There are similarities. We would say the revived Roman Empire continues on. But when you come to this prophecy here in this section, and he starts talking about these ten toes, all of a sudden the ten toes are finding their fulfillment in other places in Scripture. For instance, later on in Daniel, we're reading about the significance of these ten toes, and we're finding out that these... Finding out? We're finding out that these ten toes are actually uh, ten kings. 
and you're going to come back over, like I mentioned, to Revelation, and you get into Revelation 13 and so forth, and it's talking about these, these kings. And so we're looking at it and going, okay, there must be a time gap between when Rome fell and these ten toes are crushed by God. This is where prophecy starts to intermingle, and you start to see it connect. So you go over to Revelation, and you start reading about who the one world leader is, this, this creature that comes out of the sea, and, and you're looking at that, and you're saying, oh, okay, and then you have these ten kings, and these ten kings are putting their, their blessing on this one, and it is ultimately the second coming of Christ, where Christ comes back to judge, and he crushes the stone, crushes these ten toes. So all of a sudden, we've shifted gears, and we've gone from a history lesson to a prophecy lesson. And, it, and it's just like that. And that's what, that's what, Daniel, is, uh, that's what Daniel is experiencing here. Now, I, I notice here that um, when you look at it and you understand that these, these ten horns, for instance, in Daniel's first vision in, in Daniel chapter 7, you, you begin to, to just really paint a picture and understand all of... The significance is here. Now it's, it's interesting to know this intermingling uh, that takes place, and you'll see that there in your Bibles if you, you look. The intermingling takes place, and it doesn't work out very well. It doesn't work out. Um, we don't know what this intermingling is. The reference may be uh, a reference to intermingling strong people from strong countries with weaker people in weaker countries. Um, or else the strong people within a given country with the weaker people of that country um, to provide more strength. Uh, we do know the Antichrist, he's called the Little Horn in chapter 7, the leading king of the restored empire, will lead in this activity of trying to get them to mingle. Now let me just give you a sidelight and I'll give you an opinion, and you can feel free to disagree. As I look at this world today, there's a massive difference in how we think today than we did even 25 years ago. For instance, globalization is the word. Everything's about globalization. And with the millennials today, the millennials think a lot different than the baby boomers. Okay? Uh, there's a different mindset. And I'm not even talking about uh, outside of Christianity. Within Christianity, there's just a different mindset, the process of thinking. They've been trained to think globally. What is it? Think globally, act locally, right? Okay. Whatever that means, I don't even know. Um, but the reality is uh, that that yes, I mean, this whole world is going to be part of something global, and it fits the purpose of this one world leader. It fits the purpose very, very well. And I think you see that that intermingling is going to be attempted because you need the world to come together and back this one world leader. Remember. How many currencies are there under the one world leader? One. One monetary currency. You could have to have a lot of people get behind that, aren't you? In order for something like that to happen. They are going to do that, again, because it's not so much about the national. I think uh, nationality and patriotism, I, I see that as a, a major decline. Not only here in the United States, but across nations, across the spectrum. Uh, when you look at how the demographics are changing, for instance, in Europe, and you see all of the, the immigration that's taking place there, we have a changing landscape uh, everywhere that you look. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. And unfortunately for the Antichrist, it's not going to work out. Uh, this is um, an, an interesting time. And I think all of this, this globalization and, and pulling these, mingling these together, um, it, it really stems from a rebellion towards God over what God was doing when he blows up the Tower of Babel. Remember Nimrod? He's building the Tower of Babel, right? He's building it, and God comes down and he says, that's it. I'm not going to allow for this anymore. He scatters people with their languages and nationalities and so forth. And he does that so that man can't come together. Back in the 1500s, an artist painted what his mindset was with regard to what the Tower of Babel looked like. 
And so he drew this picture, and he's very trying to be very accurate. He leaves a whole section of it unfinished. It's pretty interesting. Leaves this whole section unfinished because that they were in the midst of battle, you know, building it when God said, "No, that's it." So European Parliament, right? The European Union, their Parliament building. They build this thing out of glass and mirrors and all that, you know, to make it really look contemporary. And what do they model it after? You want to take a guess? The artist's rendition of Babel. And there's a poster that they make, and it says, uh, many tongues, one voice. In other words, we all have these problems with having different languages, but we're all one voice together. It's amazing how in the face of our creator that is. And to the credit of some of the people in Europe, they actually protested this poster that was being used to support this and, and get the word out. And they actually pulled it. So I'm happy about that. They're still righteous. And there are still people holding back the things of, of evil. And that's a good thing. That, that's a very positive thing. But mankind has wanted to come together and for the wrong reasons. And it's unfortunate um, that his desire is still this way. I don't think a lot has changed in the hearts of men uh, since the Tower of Babel, to be honest with you. Remember, we have that sin nature that's the same today as it was way back then. So these uh, are not going to, to make it. They're not going to cling together. And it's just not going to work out. Now, what's going to happen here is you have these ten kings, and they will be absolutely smashed by God. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So we have four kingdoms, and they've all been destroyed. Four kingdoms have had their time, and I'm going to say goodbye to this guy. Um, they, they've had this, this works good. Why does the stone just point to the feet, though? The stone points to the feet because at the end time, the only part of this that's still in existence is the ten toes. Oh, I see. Okay? You have a revived Roman Empire, and it's, and it's lived out in those ten kings, within those ten kings. And so when the stone comes, that's why it's smashing just that part. Now, when Christ comes back, he sets this kingdom up that will never be destroyed. And the kingdoms will not be left, he says, for another people. It will crush or smash and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it itself endures forever. So inasmuch as he says, as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands... And that it crushed the iron. Oh, wait a minute. Did you all see that? Did you see that? I was just reading that. There, it's fascinating to me. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. What does that mean? That means that this kingdom was not of man's doing at all. It is divinely appointed. And, of course, my brain just goes right back over. And I just have to read this for you. Over in 2 Corinthians, one of my favorite passages in the world. I can't believe Dr. Berger had preached on it when he was here. <laughs> but it says that uh, when he's talking about um, that God has, has torn our, our earthly tent, he says, which is our house now, is torn down. We have a building from God that wakes us, speaking about our glorified body. And he says, <laughs> not made with hands. Not made with hands. Isn't that great? If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, they're talking about stuff that's not made with hands. You come to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's not made with hands. I just love that. I think that's fantastic. Chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. So, so it's neat to see this is what God is doing here, um, continuing to read on. And it says, inasmuch as you saw the stone, um, not made with hands, that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. When this stone crashes in to the finality that is here with this, it will basically eliminate this, but in the process, it is turning to dust every sin-dominated nation that was part of Israel's uh, unfortunate history uh, going way back. And so it's, a, it's an amazing event. And Daniel tells this to the king. The king's probably scratching his head, right? He's listening. He said, what, what, what? But this is, this is something 
that is enormously important. Take your Bibles and find with me the book of Zechariah. You've got to go towards the New Testament. It's almost right at the very end. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and Zechariah is just right behind it. Zechariah is giving to us a prophecy, and I want to pick up on the justice of the Lord that is coming for Jerusalem. In verse 15, Zechariah says, I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'll return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem, again proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So there's future hope for the people here in Jerusalem. Now, what he's saying here is fascinating because he goes into a little bit of prophecy in verse 18. And he says this, Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. Uh, the four horns that are being spoken of here are a reference here uh, to four kingdoms. Four kingdoms. Uh, the word uh, in the Hebrew denotes uh, a horn or a ram or a goat or an ox, uh, very, very common. Um, but it was also commonly symbolizing strength or power of nations or individuals even. It often symbolized a Gentile king as representing his kingdom. So when you come to Zechariah, Zechariah is talking about these four horns, four kingdoms. Now, four kingdoms... Give me the four kingdoms, would you? Yeah. All right, so we got this this is the bomb of the snowman here. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have Babylon. <coughs> Babylon? <laughs> you know, Persia? Greece. Greece. Rome. And then Rome. Keep that in mind. These are the four horns that Daniel is speaking about. Now, Daniel is going to, to mention that these are there in his vision. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are they? And he answered, they're the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Uh, in other words, God has used them in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 19. And he says, these horns have been used basically by God to judge the people of Israel for their sin. And he says this. He says as he goes on, then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lined or lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. So these four craftsmen are sometimes interpreted uh, smiths. And I'm not talking about like Mr. Smith. I'm talking about like a blacksmith who would take a, a hammer and an anvil and would pound something out. And this is the idea, and, and he's talking here basically, um, it's, it's an interesting term because he's actually talking here about skilled craftsmen. Artisifers is what they are. Not to be con misconstrued with artisans, but those who would artificate. <laughs> But that's the idea. They are, they are literally people who are skilled in developing artifices, and they are artificers. Artisifers. <laughs> All right, let's just call them craftsmen. All right, let's go. Craftsmen, smiths, whatever. But they're, they're singled out for a very unique purpose, okay? And the purpose is, is phenomenal when you stop and you, you think about what God is, is doing here. 
Um, because what he is doing is he's using these kings uh, to judge. And he goes on with this, and he begins to, to speak about all of these things that are going to happen. Now, let's just notice here who, if this is the first horn, who would be the first smith? The first smith. Second horn. Neo Persia. Who's the third? Who's the third smith? No, no, bro. I was just seeing if you were sleeping. I wanted to see. It's almost 8 o'clock, and I wanted to see. I thought, well, if you're still with me, I'll go another few minutes. If not, I'll just wrap it up. Okay, so they're the third smith. That means these guys are the second smith. And this is the third horn, and this is the fourth horn. <coughs> now, Rome, <coughs> there's three smiths. <coughs> Who's the fourth smith? Still continuing. It's future. The fourth smith is future. But it's Christ. And this Roman Empire that has been destroyed has a dot, dot, dot to it. And this revised Roman Empire continues on and will become powerful under the Antichrist during the tribulation period. And then that fourth smith is the one who will judge that new revived Roman Empire. And so, when he looks at this, he sees four, smith, four smiths. I think that's the key thing that you want to keep um, that you want to keep in mind. It's uh, four smiths, not three. So when we look back on it, we would say, okay, well, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome were all smiths, the craftsmen. They were the ones who came in and smashed those other nations. But the fourth smith, and he talks about this fourth craftsman there in Zechariah chapter 1, has yet to occur. It's yet to, to come into play. But it is coming. And this is the kingdom that is not made with hands. It's not, it's, it's not cut out of the stone with hands. It is a divine kingdom. It's Christ's kingdom. And that's pretty amazing. And when you look at this, it's, uh, it's interesting because at the first take of it, you would say, oh, it looks like these three kingdoms uh, came to an end just because, of, just because of man's doing. When you go back to Daniel and you, you see how how the Roman Empire is affected. And you, you realize that the Roman Empire um, is weakened. Uh, interesting to note there, just uh, kind of a, a sidebar. When you look at the kneecap, the kneecap to the ankle of the Roman Empire, what's that made out of? Iron. Iron. Is there any clay mixed in it? So it speaks to an empire that's stronger in the beginning and then weaker at the end. Have you ever read the book, The Fall of the Roman Empire? Well, it's about this thick. It's got a little tiny print. Okay, so if you haven't, I understand. Um, it's interesting, but you see the moral decay that takes place in the Roman Empire that leads itself to become weaker. They had so much going on. Uh, they, they had done so many amazing things. Uh, the Roman Empire was very strong. It was, it was well run in a lot of ways. Um, but... The sin that was at the core rotted them out from the inside. And uh, unfortunately, in the United States and Europe and so forth, we see uh, a similar pattern. And, and I wouldn't even make it a national pattern. I think it's a worldwide dilemma here that we have where the world is just, not, you know, just falling into wickedness. I mean, it's just an incredible, incredible scene. 
And I think uh, the United States is probably one of the, the last places that has held on to morality. And certainly, uh, the church has got the reason for that. And, and we hold on to uh, the truth. But it's just amazing how the world lives. And, and Rome becomes very weak during this time. So when you look at it, you say, well, yeah, they fell. They became you know, rotten to the core with sin. But the thing we have to keep in mind is, again, who's the kingmaker? God. God is the kingmaker. If you um, stop and think about this uh, with me, this fourth uh, kingdom, uh, supernaturally destroyed by Christ. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was raised up for a very important purpose. Um, let me just see if I can... Jeremiah 25, 9. Jeremiah writes, and he says, Behold, I'll send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against his land, against its inhabitants. I want you to listen as I read this again. And tell, me, tell me the two important words here in this verse, would you? Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land. Who is God's servant? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a servant of God raised up to chastise the sinning people. Take your Bibles if you want to go to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44 is another um, good, good spot to take a look at. Cyrus was this great king. He was called Cyrus the Great. He was this Persian king. He cast down Babylon. But uh, notice what God says about Cyrus the Great in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28. It says there, It is I who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. New American Standard has the H capitalized and the M capitalized in mind. He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. So here is Cyrus, here is Nebuchadnezzar. Both of them are being used by God. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. This is over in chapter 45, verse 1 whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. So the Lord has, is using Cyrus. What about Alexander the Great? Let's go find Zechariah again. We've got to go find Zechariah. You know where he is now. Zechariah 9. Alexander the Great destroys this mighty Persian power, that is Cyrus the Great. So you have Alexander the Great knocking off Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great wasn't there when Alexander came along later. But he comes along and he is victorious, that is Alexander the Great. And again, he's executing the plan of God. Because... One of the things that he did, and he did a lot of things, Alexander the Great was, was a tremendous, you know, powerful king, very war-oriented. War um, but I want you to see here that there was a very powerful city known as Tyre. And the Bible says, the burden of the word of the Lord is against the, the land of Hadrach, which Damascus had its resting place for the eyes of men, especially while the tribes of Israel are toward the Lord. And Hamath also, which borders on it, Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. For Tyre built herself a fortress and piled up silver like dust and gold like the mire of the streets. So it's a very wealthy place. If, you've done, if you don't know anything about Tyre, go check it out. Go check out its geographical location. Pretty, pretty fascinating. Behold, he says, the Lord will dispose of, or dispossess her and cast her wealth into the sea and she will be consumed with fire this is a prophecy that God uses against Tyre and guess who is able to go in and conquer Tyre Alexander the Great exactly so Alexander the Great along with Cyrus the Great along with Nebuchadnezzar all being used by God 
all part of God's plan. And God used them. He empowered them. He is the one who set them up. And he is the one who brought them down. It is our God who is in control of this world, all the world's affairs. And make no mistake about it, uh, he is still on the throne today. And he is that fourth smith that will come and judge that revived Roman Empire, the one that's so hideous. And it's, it's very fitting that it's Christ who comes as that stone, that mountain, because the, the last kingdom is so horrendous, because you have the Antichrist who has taken his place at the seat of the temple. And I mentioned this on Sunday. If you were here on Sunday, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we were talking about the man of sin being revealed. I'll tell you, the man of sin... I believe personally that there's been a lot of antichrists. I believe Satan is throwing antichrists up all the time. And eventually God's going to say, you know what? It's time. Uh, the people in Europe are all up in arms right now because they think that the antichrist is on the scene in Europe. Look up the, the prime minister of Greece. Came out of nowhere, and he's got some interesting things surrounding him, some, some mysterious things about him. And uh, especially the believers in Europe, they've got it all figured out. It's definitely him. Um, I don't know who it is, but, but God does. And it's all part of that plan. But even as powerful as he gets, even though he controls economics and so forth, God will come and boom, when Christ's second coming occurs, it's going to crush that last empire. And then at last, we'll have the millennial kingdom that will be set up, Christ's kingdom here on the earth, and what a joy and blessing that will be. So, a lot of things that, that, to think about. Hopefully I didn't overload you too much here uh, tonight. Bob, did you have a question? Bob, did you have a question? A simple question. I've never heard of Hadrach before. Where? I don't know. Where? That's the wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> the land of Hadrach. Yeah. Well, it must be near Syria. Uh, and if you look, I don't know if that Bible map last year or last week that I gave you has it. Uh, it has no brand. Yeah. Um, it's mentioning Syria at the same time, so it's probably in that northern area, uh, running from what's today is modern day Beirut across uh, to Syria, somewhere in there. I don't see it on a map. I can't, uh, can't jog my brain. Sorry. Let's have a word of prayer then. Uh, you've been a great class. This one. Next week we'll be in chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement that we have from your word. Uh, Lord, as we see these uh, nations that have just dominated the entire landscape uh, in times past, Father, just to, to recognize that, that you were engineering all of that, that you made it all possible, that you could have, you could have stopped Alexander the Great any time along the way. But Father, you had a plan for him, and you were using him even to fulfill this prophecy concerning Tyre and Sidon. Lord, I'm thankful that uh, we serve a risen God uh, who is alive, who is in control. And I pray, Father, that uh, we would understand the significance uh, of your sovereignty, in not only in the world, but also in our own personal lives. And Lord, you're uh, working in our hearts and lives, uh, bringing to bear all those things that are good uh, because it's all part of your plan. And we just give you thanks for this, Father. Uh, we also are, are thankful that uh, there is a bright future ahead and that, Lord, uh, you have uh, put all these things um, together so that your plan would come together at just the right moment. And Father, uh, it seems like we're living in the last days as we look into this world. We, we see uh, the impact of sin and its growing influence in the world. Um, and, and it's sobering, Lord. Um, and at times it's shocking. Uh, Father, uh, we recognize how, how horrific some of the things are that are going on today. And uh, our hearts grow heavy. Um, but Lord, uh, we know that there's a bright future. And we know, Lord, that you judge and, and you make all things right. So I thank you, Father, for uh, giving us your word. We thank you, Father, for these prophecies that are so, uh, so amazing. It's just so amazing, Lord, that prophecies that you gave to Daniel uh, thousands of years ago uh, came true uh, to, to exactness. And, Lord, uh, here we are today, and we're waiting for this, this fourth craftsman, Lord, and uh, we know that that time is around the corner, and we thank you for it. 
Bless each one, Lord. Give us a great week, I pray in Christ's name.